so much for inviting me. This is my first trip to Taiwan, and I've been looking forward to it very much. I'm really delighted to be here. I hope this will be the first of many visits. I love this image of the big sign, Fashion, at the museum, because it's so hard to imagine how fashion became important in the museum world. For a long time, fashion was looked down on as being a frivolous, not serious topic, not worthy to be in the hallowed halls of an art museum. So when the Scaparelli Fashion Exhibition was in Philadelphia, I made sure to get a picture of this wonderful image. Now I was asked to say a few words about how I became a fashion curator. I went to Yale to get my PhD in modern European cultural history. And the very first term I was there, we were assigned to uh, give a report on two scholarly papers. I don't remember which ones I read, probably something on the French Revolution. But my classmate, Judy Coffin, gave a report about two scholarly articles about the Victorian corset. One article said that the corset was dangerous to women and very oppressive. The other said it was sexually liberated. It was just as though a light bulb had gone on in my mind and I realized fashion's part of culture. I can do fashion history. And that changed my entire life. After that, what all I studied and wrote about and taught and created exhibitions and a magazine on was fashion. I ended up, uh, after being briefly at the Smithsonian, teaching fashion history at the Fashion Institute of Technology, and eventually becoming chief curator and then director of the museum at FIT. So here you see the front of the museum a couple of years ago, when I had an exhibition on dance costume, and my colleague did another exhibition on lingerie. This museum was founded in 1969, which means that next year we'll be celebrating our 50th anniversary. So I'll spend just a couple minutes telling you a little bit about the history. Back in the early 20th century, at the Brooklyn Museum of Art, they started a design laboratory to show American designers how they could get inspiration from historic and ethnographic clothes. And then they brought the, some of the collection to New York, to the Fashion Institute of Technology, so students and designers could use it for inspiration. But even before the museum was started, the curator from Brooklyn moved to FIT and started collecting. So this is one of hundreds of garments that Lauren Bacall, the actress, gave to the museum. And then this Charles James is from Doris Duke, a very eminent collector and, and socialite. So this was the beginning of our collection. Meanwhile, at other museums, there were many museums, like the Victoria and Albert, the Metropolitan Museum, that had collections of costume, historic costume. But the exhibitions they put on tended to be very boring. They were very chronological, they were uh, anecdotal, it was sort of, here's dress over the centuries. They tried to make it realistic, but not very many people were really interested. Then at the Victoria and Albert, uh, the famous fashion photographer Cecil Beaton did in 1971 a really exciting, jazzy, fashionable fashion exhibition. A year or two later, in New York, Mrs. Diana Freeland, formerly the editor-in-chief of Vogue, started doing exhibitions at the Metropolitan Museum's Costume Institute. So her exhibitions were often not very accurate historically. So here you see really exaggerated wig. No one wore a wig that big in the 18th century. But they were spectacular and exciting. She had music and all kinds of images. So people started becoming excited about fashion exhibitions. And they started thinking of it as fashion. Not long after, 
FIT finally built a building in 76, and they had their first exhibition in that building. Uh, and this was Poiret, King of Fashion. It had almost 100 Poiret ensembles and a really beautiful set design. So here in the center, you have one replica, which was Poiret's costume, but all the rest are, are historic period Poirets, many of them loaned by French museums, even loaned by Madame Poiret, Paul Poiret's widow, who was still alive then. So this was a very exciting moment where FIT, quite early on, was doing important exhibitions. This is one of uh, our Poirets that we're going to be putting on display next year to celebrate our 50th anniversary. We'll do a show about all of our many exhibitions. Not all of them, because we've done more than 200 exhibitions since we were started. But we'll look at about 35 exhibitions. Uh, meanwhile, we also did one on a living designer, Hubert de Givenchy. So this again had almost 100 dresses by his clients, including Audrey Hepburn. Uh, Mr. Givenchy came to New York. There was also a live couture fashion show, a big fancy dinner. It was really elaborate. And Givenchy also gave some beautiful dresses to the museum's permanent collection. Meanwhile, at the Metropolitan, Mrs. Freeland was also doing a living designer, Yves Saint Laurent. This, however, caused tremendous controversy because the press said, this is like giving a museum gallery to a car manufacturer to say, here, promote your business. It's free advertising. No one cared that FIT did it because we were just a fashion school, a fashion museum. But to have a great art museum show a living designer was controversial. And the Metropolitan started a policy where for the next more than 20 years, they didn't show any single exhibition about a living designer. They thought it was too controversial. Meanwhile, back at FIT, uh, a new team came in. Richard Martin and Harold Coda and Laura Cinderbrand started putting on great exhibitions uh, like fashion and surrealism, where they brought in things like the Salvador Dali dress with the lobster, and started showing how fashion and art could be connected. This was a very important thing for Richard Martin, who was a kind of mentor to me. Uh, he really helped young fashion scholars to realize that fashion was an important topic and that you could begin to do exciting things with that. So Richard helped me get my first job teaching fashion history while he was in charge of the museum. Another very important show that Richard and Harold did was Three Women. Here you see the one big gallery devoted to Ray Kawakubo of Comme des Garçons. And she had the mannequins on the floor. You could walk very close to them. It was not the way museums are allowed to do now. You could never do that now unless the designer chose to do it. Here you see a close-up. This was an important show because Richard and Harold and Laura wanted to compare the work of three designers, Claire McArdle, the American, um, Madeleine Viennet, the French woman, and Rei Kawakubo of Japan. And this was such an inspiring show. It actually inspired my book, Women of Fashion, because I wanted to ask the same question that the exhibit asked. Do women design clothes differently than men do? And this was a fascinating question which took me some years of research. Many years later, I went back to it a little bit with the show Fashioning the Modern Woman, which looked at women designers in between World War I and II. In Paris, women like Chanel, Schiaparelli, Viennet, but also Madame Grey, uh, Louise Boulanger, Augusta Bernard, Sonia Delaunay. It was the golden age of the woman designer. Meanwhile, back in the old days, 
Richard and Harold did another great show that was pioneering on menswear, jocks and nerds, looking at different stereotypes about men. And this idea is still relatively rare. There are very few shows just devoted to menswear, even today. My colleague, Patricia Mears, has made something of a specialty of doing menswear shows. Here she did Ivy Style, which is looking at the influence of Ivy League men's fashions. And she set up a display to make it look like a, an American college. And again, here you see Princeton, 67, all of these sort of Ivy League schools, Harvard, and Princeton, and Yale. Again, back in the early 1990s, Richard and Harold did a big show about Halston, absolute modernism, which they did the year after Halston died. And really, they showed his clothes along with patterns, he had died in such disgrace, having lost the rights to his name. And they pointed out he was a great designer. He was a really interesting, important designer. Recently, Patricia Mears looked at this again. This is from the 19 very sort of modernist design of the exhibition. When Patricia did her show recently, she compared Yves Saint Laurent and Halston these 1970s years. And when I went to Paris to the Yves Saint Laurent Foundation, my friend Connie Uzo warned me. She said, don't worry, Mr. Berger was angry at you, but it's OK now. Because Pierre Berger didn't like that we had dared to compare the great genius Yves Saint Laurent with this American designer, Halston. But in fact, they were quite interesting, although very different designers each was the most important in his country in the 1970s. Before Richard and Harold went to the Metropolitan, they did one last big show at FIT, which was Gianni Versace. And Versace was still alive. He took part in the exhibition. It was very exciting. And then they went up to the Metropolitan. And FIT went into a new phase with a new director, who eventually hired me to come on as the chief curator. One of my first shows was China Chic, East Meets West. These are three couture pieces that I borrowed from the Yves Saint Laurent Foundation. And you can see how uh, Saint Laurent was inspired by a kind of fantasy image of China. Nothing realistic, but a magical image. I tried to show, though, that it was not just a question of Westerners being inspired by Chinese dress, but that fashion was not simply a Western phenomenon. That if you look at Chinese history, you find that something like fashion was already emerging in Chinese history. So if you look at Chinese art, Sui Dynasty sculpture has very different clothes than Tang Dynasty sculpture. Of course, when I did the China Chic show, I was totally inspired by Akiko Fukai's exhibition on Japanese, which was the first really important and groundbreaking exhibition to look at the influence of fashion from one country on the rest of the world. The corset was what got me into studying fashion in the first place. So naturally, when I had an opportunity to do a big exhibition on the corset, that was very important to me. The corset fashioning the body took place in 2000. So I had just come on board as an acting director of the museum. And the first room, I looked at the history of what's really the most controversial garment in the history of fashion. Was it something terribly unhealthy that oppressed women? Or was it more complicated than that? So I began with a, uh, a couple of very beautiful late 19th century courses. And then I went back to look from the 18th century right up through the ends of girdles uh, in the first room to s explore the history of corsetry as a form of body modification and creating foundations for fashion. 
And here I showed corsets were not just worn by wealthy women. Contrary to what people often believe, working class women also wore corsets. In fact, this sort of grayish brown corset in the front was uh, a corset that I borrowed from an English collection. It was named the Pretty Housemaid Corset. And it was billed as being the cheapest and strongest corset made. So uh, if you were down on your hands and knees scrubbing the floor, this corset wouldn't break. And the bones were not whalebone, of course. Whalebone was much too expensive. The whales were already being driven to extinction. But they were metal bones. And that was compared with others, which were uh, custom-made corsets with silk, colorful, beautiful uh, exteriors and whalebone interiors. But even working class women wanted to have the same silhouette at, as elite women. And with the mass production of corsets, they could get them relatively inexpensively. It didn't look glamorous from the appearance, but it gave you exactly the same body type. I also wanted to talk to people about the size of corsets, because I wish I had a dollar for every time I've heard somebody say, remember Scarlett O'Hara's 18-inch waist? I have heard so often about 18-inch, 17-inch, 16-inch waist. So I've, over the years, I measured hundreds of corsets in museum collections, not just the waist, but also the hips and the bust, because very few are as small as these mythical corsets. This one here has a tiny, tiny little 19-inch waist, but it also has tiny little 28-inch hips and a tiny little 30-inch bust. The woman was a stick insect, so tiny. Um, and the others can be often quite large, can have a 30-inch waist or a 32-inch waist. And this is when they're laced completely closed in back. Often women left them open an inch or two because they like to say, oh, I wear a 22-inch corset, but in fact, it was larger. So I wanted people to have a sense, what's the reality of corsets as opposed to fantasy? Oops, sorry, put it back first. Okay, I'm going back now. Let's see. Okay, now. So the first room looked at the history of corsets. The second room looked at how the corset has influenced fashion. And here I started with a real Victorian corset, but I put it next to an evening dress by Christian Lacroix, which had a corset bodice designed in that same Belle Epoque style, but the rest of it was a Victorian-inspired evening gown. And next to that, I had others by designers such as Valentino, Faf, Dior, uh, Vivian Westwood. Because it turns out, of course, that in the 20th and now also the 21st century, the corset has inspired many designers. So for example, here you see a famous corset designed by John Galliano when he was at Christian Dior in 1997. And John was inspired by the African corset garment worn by men of the Dinka tribe in East Africa. So I borrowed that center one from the Museum of Natural History, put it next to the Dior, and then I also have another one by Christian Lacroix to show how some designers have been inspired by a Victorian or Belle Epoque corset, others by ideas of primitive corsets. And then others, such as Vivian Westwood, by the idea of the hard body. So that she's created a corset dress, which is imitation naked body, but covered with Swarovski rhinestones. And in fact, when I used to teach fashion history, my students would say to me, why did women give up wearing a corset? And I used to say to them, they didn't really give it up. They just internalized it through diet, exercise, and later plastic surgery. In 
instead of having a hard corset, they wanted to have a hard body. So I thought maybe I should end my show with, you know, liposuction needles. But I thought that would, I finally decided not to do that. But in reality, the corset was superseded, internalized by other forms of practice. One show which had an enormous impact on me and many other curators was the one on subculture that the Victoria and Albert had in, I believe, the early 1990s. This show looked at how fashion moved from the sidewalk to the catwalk. So it showed how punk's clothing inspired high fashion, hippie's clothing inspired high fashion, and of course, it was very criticized at the time because it was such a new paradigm. But it's been so important, it subsequently inspired many of my shows, uh, like London Fashion or Gothic. It inspired Andrew Bolton to do his punk show. Everybody had looks back at this show when they want to do something exciting about street style. Let me see what time we have. Plenty of time still. So here's a shot of my London fashion show, which I was happy to say won the first Richard Martin Award for a fashion exhibition. Because after Richard died, he had left in his will money for a prize and for a student symposium about fashion. And here, this one we borrowed clothes from Alexander McQueen, from Hussein Shalayan, from Galliano, from Boudicca, from many, many English designers. And we set it up from the 1960s on to look at mod London and then punk London. We had wonderful Vivian Westwoods with punk um, t-shirts. For the opening party, we had Prince Andrew come. This was uh, caused great conundrum because we had security officers. One of our sponsors was, um, what's the English car company, Johnny? Um, Jaguar. Jaguar was there, so they parked a Jaguar in front of the museum, and the British security were looking under it for bombs, searching the building. Prince Andrew went through, walked right past the uh, Vivian Westwoods with the pictures of the Queen on them with safety pins. Didn't look at that, kept going through. Um, but this was back when you could really get a lot of clothes easily from designers. McQueen, no problem. They have all just arrived. Sometimes they would come even just on a FedEx box. When I did another show about red dresses, I wrote to McQueen people, no answer, no answer, then suddenly thud, FedEx box on my desk. Inside was the McQueen. I thought, okay, it's arrived. Everything was much more ad hoc. Another show that I did that I loved was Femme Fatale, uh, Fashion in Fin de Siècle of France. And this was a little bit inspired by the Belle Epoque show at the Metropolitan Museum, but it was inspired to be against that one, because that one had all, just all the myths about Paris and the Belle Epoque. And I thought to myself, what was really happening was much more interesting. What was really happening with the birth of the couture and the mixture of great courtesans and great ladies walking past each other on the stair of the House of Worth, that the courtesans were setting fashions that were then being copied by wealthy American women and women around the world. That, to me, was really an exciting story to tell. And it set up our first, it was the occasion for our first fashion symposium. So, Afterwards, we had one and now two fashion symposia every year to go along with some of our big exhibitions because this then would bring in a chance to bring people over to talk about other aspects of fashion related to the exhibition. In addition, of course, we've been trying to have books about as many of our exhibitions as possible because an exhibition only lasts four to six months and then it's gone, and so it's important to try and have a record of it. One exhibition that I saw in Antwerp, um, Malign Muses, When Fashion Turns Back, by Judith Clark, had a huge impact on me, and I suspect on many other uh, curators, because Judith trained as an architect, 
And suddenly she made the way the exhibition was set up such an important part of the story that was told. I think most of us curators, we look at the clothes first. We want to tell a story with objects. But Judith really told the story and then she found the objects later to fit in. So she would, sorry, she would have things like when she wanted to talk about how fashion would influence from one period to another. For example, she had giant cog wheels and on one it would be a Victorian dress and it would turn and another one would turn with a neo-Victorian modern dress and they would just pass each other and you could suddenly think, oh, fashion from the past is coming up and meeting us today. And that was so clever. Of course, my conservator would never allow us to move our fashion on a jerky wheel, but the idea was quite brilliant. And so when, when I did my show Gothic Dark Glamour, I said to my staff, we need to really create a mise-en-scene, a setting which will give the sense of what Gothic is about. That the Gothic is a, an idea that's about death, destruction, and decay. It's about the glamour, really, of terror and, and sort of erotic danger. It goes way back in time. And we need a setting that will create this feeling. So I got the idea back when I was still teaching. Uh, and I was seeing a lot about how designers had been inspired by subculture and musicians. Like the subculture show at the v &A that kind of implied that when there were punks on the street, they inspired designers to copy punks. And the story was that gothic, goths, gothic punks inspired designers. So here you have a gothic punk musician. And then the idea was, did they inspire designers like Olivier Teskins? Now, Teskins said, no, no, I didn't even know who these goth kids were. I, when they asked him about this, he said, are you talking about copying gothic cathedrals? What do you mean? And I wanted to prove that no, he was not copying the goth kids and the goth musicians, but both the goth kids and the designers were inspired by a whole history, literary, artistic, cinematic, and from that they each created a style which we could call a gothic style. So for example, something like a Fuseli painting in the 18th century, it's the painting of the nightmare, where she's in a white chemise. Has she fainted? Has she died? Who's this monster on top of her? At the same time in the 18th century, the idea of the Gothic literature of terror developed with early stories about the Middle Ages with scary, creepy knights and monks and endangering people. That all started a trend which later led to writers like Edgar Allan Poe or stories like Frankenstein or Dracula. And the whole, by the Victorian period, you had a whole cult of mourning, a cult of dressing up in black for years and mourning the dead. So I set up another vignette which we had mourning dresses and a coffin next to them and a mourning veil in back to show one of the things that inspired then later designers like Alexander McQueen inspired by Victoriana and especially by this cult of mourning. So, and vampire stories. So here we have a Thierry Mugler dress inside another coffin. This was inspired by a window at Barney's department store that Simon Doonan had thought of putting uh, another Mugler, very vampirish look inside a coffin in the window. And the dress next to it, the red dress, by Eiko Ishioka, the brilliant film costume designer. This was from the movie Brown Stoker's Dracula. So again, films, books, all of these brought ideas about vampires and sexy creatures of the night. Dracula is a very sexy book. It's all about 
and strange perverse sexuality and, and the exchange of bodily fluids at night. The color black also is a big part not only of gothic style but of high fashion. When I was working on this show, I, tell, I wrote a letter to Anne de Mullemeester, the Belgian designer, and I asked to borrow one of her dresses for the show. Now, Anne is a woman who has worn nothing but black since she was 15 years old. Her collections were 95% black. She called me up and she said, Val, I trust you and I will lend you a dress, but I want you to know that I am not a gothic designer. I said, okay, Anne, what do you think gothic means? And she said, tacky, skulls all over everything. I said, well, it's dark glamour. It's kind of about dark romanticism. And she said, oh yeah, that's me, dark romanticism. <laughs> so that was okay. So we set this up again. The Gothic style is very theatrical. So we had a painted backdrop, but we made it look deliberately like in a theater, not realistic, to capture the sense of this. Gothic is also, as I said, about death and destruction. It's, it's based on ideas about the religious architecture all crumbling from the Middle Ages. And that inspired this idea of a ruined castle. And in front of it, the green dress is by Alexander McQueen from his collection about witchcraft, about his turn. We had the mannequins alone looking away from each other. Everything was as if they were disturbed and, and alone, like, like the fall of the House of Usher, if you've read Edgar Allan Poe, madness and, and destruction. We had like a prison, the sense of claustrophobia. Everything was going to be scary, and, and we brought in clothes by um, Mugler, clothes by Rick Owens. Um, Rick Owens, who said he grew up in Southern California and became a goth himself in reaction against all the sunny, sunny, blonde California. He wanted to be all in black and at night and listening to Wagner. He said he looks at goth kids today and feels like he's their dad. And, and of course, we had Comme des Garçons. We wanted a section to look like a laboratory, like Frankenstein. So again, sort of we were inspired by this from a, a Spanish fashion photographer, Recuenco. And we set up a section with rubber walls, again, like a madhouse, and with faces pressing through the walls, inspired by a horror film. And each face was hand-carved. And the dresses were all mechanical, again. We had this corset by Alexander McQueen, made out of leather with big, rough Frankenstein stitching on it. Again, to look at the idea of creating monsters. What was Gothic fashion going to be about? And of course, we had a section about goth kids and about, you know, Gothic musicians, like from, from goth bands like Specimen, right up through cyberpunk. So this was great fun. I had so many goth kids coming to visit me. Um, that it got to the point where the guard downstairs in the museum, some kid would come in all dressed in black, black hair, piercings, and he'd go, she's on the third floor. Because we knew these were the kids. But, but they were so wonderful, so articulate. They had read all of the Edgar Allan Poe. They knew so much about the culture of Gothic life. Another show that was great fun was Japan Fashion Now. I have always loved Japan. Japan is one of the most fashion-forward countries in the world. And I wanted to do a show that looked at Japan as it was in the 21st century. There were many shows that had looked at the Japanese fashion revolution in the 80s with Kambe Garçon, with Yoji Yamamoto. I started this early section about that. But most of the show was about what happened later in the, in the 20th century and in the 21st century. How did it change 
how did the influence of contemporary Japanese art become really important in the 1990s? And most of all, I wanted to give New Yorkers an idea of what it was like to go to Tokyo. Tokyo is such a great shopping place. Every time I go, I spend $1,000 on the first day um, because there's, everything is so new and exciting. So I wanted the set to look like Blade Runner. I wanted it to look like a kind of dystopian city of the future, but different neighborhoods. So I sent my husband John around town with, pic with instructions. Take a picture of the Prada store in Omoto Sando. Take a picture of this and that. So then we would do, we'd send the pictures in to be, first of all, turn it from color to black and white, and then distort it. And so then we would have, this is sort of a distorted version of the Prada store of Omoto Sando. And we'd have, here we've got a lot of the undercover fashions. And then we'd move to other parts of town. And we, the menswear is fabulous in Tokyo. Really, really avant-garde and excited. So I went around and interviewed different menswear designers. And oh, the, this got a huge amount of attention because you couldn't buy these clothes in New York. Certain hip-hop stars would go to Tokyo and they would have copies made from their size. And then, of course, the street style. So again, sort of the Harajuku style. So we then had the little Lolita clothes. We also had schoolgirl uniforms. Uh, and then I became fascinated at the Lolita stores. They had these amazing, expensive, beautiful fashion dolls. And so I started borrowing some of those to put on display. And we had all kinds of live events. We had a, a Japanese fashion, live fashion show. We had a Japanese tea party. We had Miss Cute Japan come and visit, which got all of her, 800 of her fans were there. It became a real event. Um, this is from another show we did on Shoe Obsession, but the transition is this is by a Japanese designer who's been working on these wonderful, wonderful shoes. So I was able to introduce him to Daphne Guinness. And then, of course, Daphne started wearing his shoes. That was probably the most successful, most popular of our shows was the Shoe Obsession show. Hint to museum people. If you want to get a lot of people in your exhibition, show shoes. Show modern shoes, not historic shoes. People want to see modern extreme shoes. My colleague Patricia is more of a connoisseur than I am. I like to do sort of wild cultural shows like Gothic or Japan. She does shows where she looks at a beautiful designer like Madame Grey and analyzes the construction and the style, the classicism, for example, of Madame Grey, which, of course, has inspired many other curators as well. You had Madame Grey shows at, in Paris, for example. She also did American Beauty, which looked at a variety of different American designers, say, to the Europeans, who always say Americans only just do blue jeans and sportswear. Patricia said, no, no, Americans can also do very elaborate evening wear, beautiful clothes. That's just a stereotype that there's no fashion in America. Working with Daphne was wonderful. I, I met her at one of our fundraising lunches, sat her next to me, and as soon as I met her, I said, would you like to do an exhibition with me? And she's like, oh, no, no, I couldn't do that. And I gave her a tour of American Beauty. And she, we were looking around, and she said, were you serious about doing a show with me? And I said, yes, look, sweetie, there's 80 dresses here. I said, you've got 80 dresses, don't you? And she said, yes. So we went to her closet in New York and in London and picked out about 80 of her clothes and organized an exhibition. So here, for example, uh, this wonderful McQueen kimono. She told me how her friend Isabella Blow wanted her to meet McQueen. And she said, I don't need to meet him. I can just appreciate and buy his clothes. And so she was wearing this kimono dress, walking across the street in London. And suddenly, a very working class voice called out, Oi, you, 
You don't want to meet me, but you're wearing my dress. And it was McQueen. And they went off and had tea and became friends. So when we were working on the show together, I said, well, Daphne, why don't you talk to him and ask him if he'd like to do a show at FIT? And she did, and he said, don't you think it's too soon for a retrospective? And of course, sadly, within less than a year after that, he was dead. But he'd always been very generous about lending clothes, but he thought he was still too young to have a full-scale retrospective. But after he died, then, of course, the Met, which still was holding to its policy of no exhibition on a single living designer, they did one on Versace once he was dead and Alexander McQueen after he died. Another show we did recently uh, was about the influence of gay designers on fashion. A queer history of fashion from the closet to the catwalk. And we thought it would just be maybe a hundred years of fashion. You know, from, oh, you know, sort of Oscar Wilde to now, something like that. But then when I started doing research into gay history, I realized that there were gay subcultures in London and Paris and Amsterdam as far back as the 18th century. So we started looking at 18th century clothes when there were um, men who were fashion creators and fashion retailers, as, who, gay men, as early as the 18th century. There were cross-dressing cultures of men, mollies. Um, and so this became our, our new starting point. We had no idea, no fashion history had talked about this. But by crossing gay history with fashion history, we brought something new into fashion history. And this, I think, is an important idea that if you look at another field, you can often bring in something really interesting. Of course, Oscar Wilde was an important figure in fashion and bringing in things like knee breeches, looking back at 18th century fashion, bringing in ideas of aesthetic dress, the green carnation, the history of white green has been an important color for gay men as a secret code. We also looked at lesbian influence on fashion, and in particular the influence of women like Marlena Dietrich, who was a famous bisexual woman who wore men's clothes uh, both in her personal life in Berlin and in Hollywood and on screen. Uh, and we had we borrowed some of her clothes from the Berlin Film Museum, and we showed, for example, one of her tuxedos next to the the famous Le Smoking that Yves Saint Laurent had created. And Yves Saint Laurent said, my sexuality is very important to my creativity. And he also said he was inspired to do Le Smoking by having seen Marlene Dietrich in a man's evening suit. So again, you have this very complicated history of a gay male designer looking back at a bisexual woman who was cross-dressing on screen and in life. So this began to be a very interesting saga. Of course, the end midpoint of the exhibition was the AIDS crisis, when after the, the rise of gay liberation, suddenly the spread of AIDS meant that so many people were dying. And we had some of the political t-shirts and also clothes by some of the many, many people who died of AIDS. People like Halston and Perry Ellis, famous male designers. Then we went on as well and looked at the kind of hypersexual and often playful approach to gender and sexuality. Designers like Jean-Paul Gaultier, who the cone bra, who also did the pink uh, sailor suit, taking the sailor outfit, which is a gay icon, and making that fashion. The whole kind of almost drag queen aesthetic of a Thierry Mugler. The homoerotic imagery, like the Calvin Klein advertisement. We were able to look at the Versace uh, leather sex collection and compare it with, in fact, a gay leather sex ensemble uh, loaned to us anonymously by a gay male designer, which reminded me back of when I worked on my fetish book 
and I talked to some leather sex people and I said, what do you think of the Versace collection? Pretty cool, right? And they said, we hate it. And I said, really? Why do you hate it? It looks exactly like what you guys are wearing. And they said, that's right. Before you could tell what somebody liked by what they wore, now it's just a fashion statement. You have no idea if they really like that kind of sex. Another recent show by one of my young designers, one of my young curators, um, was fairy tale fashion. Colleen Hill, who just a few years ago was a graduate student in curation, is now uh, a full curator with us and is doing really wonderful shows, including this one that she did on fashion and clothes in fairy tales. Because clothes often play an important role in fairy tales and she organized it according to the fairy tale. Obviously, this is Little Red Riding Hood. And we have things like a real little 18th century Red Riding Hood from the 18th century, next to a real 18th century nightgown like Grandma would have worn and the wolf would have worn dressed up as Grandma, right up to, closest to me, a Comme des Garçons red patent leather cape. Okay. Another one she did was Rapunzel, Let Down Your Hair, with a princess in the castle letting her hair down to her boyfriend. And we have a wonderful tapestry, and then also this Alexandra McQueen dress with the gold embroidered hair. This was one of, this is a, another example of one of the two outfits that Daphne would not lend to her show. Daphne was so generous, she loaned everything I wanted except for two things. One was her copy of this dress, and one was her copy of a man's tailored suit. She said, I have to have something to wear while my exhibition is up all those months in New York. But we were eventually able to buy this dress at auction. This issue of what you acquire for a museum is very important. And we tried to buy this dress at auction before and fail. We didn't have enough money, someone else bought it. But a couple of years later it came up again and we were able to buy it. What we try and do is buy clothes that have historical and or aesthetic significance for the history of fashion. And I always say a fashion museum is like a shark. If it stops moving, it dies. A fashion museum has to keep collecting contemporary fashion. But that's tricky. It's very hard. You have to work with designers, try and get them to give you things or sell you things at a good price. If you miss it, you have to try and get it at auction. I mean, you're looking, looking for things all the time. Um, we used we use um, McQueen clothes in many of our exhibitions because he was such a genius designer. So, you know, this one dress closest to me we, was in the queer exhibition because McQueen also talked about, he said, I came out of the womb gay. I was like, you know, a little pink lamb coming out. And he said that a lot of his collections, what they had to do with was his personal life and going through struggles with, for example, his sexuality and anti-homosexual feelings that he had to grow up with living in a working class neighborhood where people would call him names. And a lot of that he had to work through in the clothes. If you see, for example, in the Joan of Arc collection about a woman who was persecuted, um, and I think he often felt like he was the outsider like that. And so sexuality was important to him, and we used him in that exhibition. This case, however, he's being uh, featured in an exhibition, Force of Nature, which is about how fashion designers have drawn inspiration from nature. Uh, and he was very much about that, from not just from going scuba diving and seeing like, life under the sea, but also ideas about evolution and de-evolution how humans might start to devolve into something else. This show also looked at, for example, the exploitation of nature, the way that feathers, for example, drove certain kinds of birds almost to extinction, 
about how other kinds of clothing might be inspired by bird patterns. This, we used uh, a lot of videos in the exhibition. This one showed birds of paradise, and again, how the color and decoration in many animals and birds is about sexual selection. It's to attract the female, and so the male birds are the decorative ones. And so the, uh, the curator, Melissa Mara, was asking, you know, does sexual selection also play a role in human fashion? Are we dressing to attract others of the opposite sex or our own sex? Why is it that women are now the fancy ones and men are the drab ones when the animal kingdom is usually the other way around? So a very, very interesting and intelligent show. This is another one by a young curator, Emma McClendon, uh, called The Body, Fashion and Physique, looking at how fashion has valorized certain body types and marginalized others. So for example, those who are too fat find it hard to get fashionable clothes. And one actress uh, actually went online and she said, nobody will dress me for the Oscars. And so a young designer said, well, I'll dress you. And he eventually then did the red dress for her. So we, the Emma looked at how fashion over the years has addressed different body types, different abilities. If you're disabled, if you're too fat, if you're pregnant, if you're too old, what are the problems and why is fashion ignoring so many people? And then the last thing I just want to show you is a few images from the show I'm working on right now. Uh, it will open next fall, so September and early January. Come to New York. It's, uh, it's pink, the history of a punk, pretty, powerful color. And we'll have about 100 dresses and menswear, but we'll also have a little vitrine based on this wonderful photograph full of little girls, pink, clothes and toys, which I've been collecting from people and children all over. My Little Ponies, Barbies, princess dresses. We'll go all the way back to the 18th century when pink was not a feminine color. It was, it was a fashionable color for men and women, as well as for interior decoration and decorative arts. Uh, we'll look at, uh, we won't have this exact painting, unfortunately, if this painting is traveling but we'll also look at the importance of pink and the body. You know, the idea of pink with, with lips and nipples and blushing. And so pink being associated with eroticism and particularly with the female body and with makeup. We'll look at pink also in menswear and cross-culturally. So we'll look at pink in Mexico, in Japan, in China, in Africa, within African American culture. Here you see the famous boxer, Sugar Ray Robinson, in 1950, wearing a pink jacket with his pink Cadillac, standing in front of his restaurant, which had Sugar Rays and pink, all of which influenced Elvis Presley, who soon got a pink Cadillac himself and wore pink jackets. And pink, in fact, has a history in rock and roll and in punk and in um, hip hop. So. Uh, one, one member of The Clash said pink is really the most rock and roll color. So we've been looking for things by different performers, male performers in pink. And then of course pink has been an absolute mania in fashion for about the last four years with millennial pink and particularly with Gucci. So we're also collecting a lot of contemporary fashion, Gucci, Valentino, Accombe de Garçon. Uh, menswear as well as women's wear to see if maybe we're coming full circle of fashion. If pink is now becoming a, a unisex uh, androgynous color that has a kind of cool quotient instead of just being a sweet feminine color. So these are just a few of the exhibitions that either have influenced me and shows that I've worked on or that my colleagues have worked on to give you a sense of the immense variety of fashion exhibitions that happen around the world today. I think I've successfully left a little bit of time for you to ask a few questions. Is there, is there time for them to ask a few? Uh, we'll have like, uh, seven minutes okay. before the end of the, the So should
should I wait now and have the second speaker come and my yeah. questions afterwards? Yeah. Or now? Which would you prefer? Yeah. We can do a few questions now while people remember. So what questions do you have for me? I'm sure you can, if you want to, you Yes, please. Uh, so you have mentioned that they want to give you a microphone. Okay. So first, thank you for your uh, fascinating speech. And I would like to ask that you have mentioned for a museum, it's very important that to collect the clothes that have the minimal for that age. So I would like to ask for you uh, to uh, to you, what's the image of fashion that could represent the age nowadays? Ah, uh, well, in the past, you could imagine a particular period with a particular style of dress. Um, because fashion was more homogenous at any given moment. When you had, for example, the new look, it came from Paris and women all over the world copied it. Christian Dior went to Japan, everywhere women did that. But beginning in the late 60s, and particularly in the 70s, you stopped having so much one fashion coming from the top and spreading everywhere. Instead, you had what Ted Bohemus calls different style tribes, who were, and they could be subcultures, punks, goths, hippies, or they could be high fashion. An Armani woman looks very different than a Versace woman, who looks different than a Prada woman, who looks different than a Celine woman. So nowadays, I think you have multiple fashions at the same time. So, I'm not sure you could have one style that represented us right now, this year, or this decade. Instead, I think you try and see if you can get some of the most important looks. You might try and get a Phoebe Philo minimalist, kind of ugly chic look, and a maximalist Gucci look. So those would be two extremes, but two very influential looks of the period now. And in fact, Melissa Mara, who did the Force of Nature show, is working on a show um, which we'll do next year on minimal maximal to try and show how fashion pivots back and forth between these two aspects. Um, I think you also find that in different periods, different issues come up more in fashion. Like in the 70s, the issue of should clothing be more androgynous or should it be very much gender specific. And in other periods like the 60s, it's, should it be youthful? Should young people have a completely new style? So different periods ask different questions of clothes. That, and though you're trying to find the clothes that will give the clearest, most directional answers. So we look for clothes. We'll look for something that will be really important in the history of fashion. That it could be couture, but it could be street style. We've gone out and we've bought, um, you know, punk clothes. It was very funny. One of my uh, young staff members had very punk pants, but he wanted a punk shirt so we could include it in the collection. And I went out with my credit card and we went to this little punk store and I was buying this. And you could see the sales girl, she's thinking, is she his mom? Why is she paying for this shirt? But I, in fact, I was buying it for the museum, but to go with pants that he had already donated to the museum. Another question. Any more time? OK, we have no more time now. We'll do oh, one more. We'll have, oh, later. We'll do more questions later, OK? Thanks so much. <laughs>